Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ebro, Laura, and Rosenberg. Uh, this morning, uh, we have at least one of my favorite candidates. I've uh, been watching for some time. I've seen uh, Kyrie Irving, uh, Sean King, our friend Tamika Mallory. Uh, you have a, a lot of people that I like. Uh, you are their favorite. Tahani Abushi is on the program. She is running for DA of Manhattan. How are you? Welcome to the program. I'm great. It's really amazing to be here. I grew up listening to Hot 97, so um, it's amazing to be with you guys. Listen, if having the best setup and microphone was the reason that you should win, you win. Well, I appreciate that. I have a pretty amazing team, so they do great. <laughs> We've interviewed a lot of people. Listen, this might look. She's got a studio, y'all. Look what's going on. Yeah, here. it's crazy. We don't play. We're not here to play. This is this is very serious. You have like a daytime talk show in there. It's even got like the font you have. Like this is crazy. Yep, we're ready to roll. Eight days left. Seven days left. Uh, now it's uh it's it's um it seems like a tight race. Um, young lady we had on uh, Tally Farhadian. She's pumping according to st rumors or or I guess. Uh, the internet, billions of her own dollars into her own campaign. Uh, when you're seeing this sort of thing, you as somebody who is, is running for Manhattan District Attorney, what do you say? This is why we got into this race, right? Is that we know that the powerful and privileged enjoy a whole other world in our city. And when it comes time to the district attorney's office, criminal justice reform, the racial disparities and the arrest of, and prosecutions of people of color, we are the communities that have been cut out of this process, uh, cut out of the reform conversation. Um, and of course, we knew that she was going to come in and throw her money around. And we were committed to outworking that money. Um, that's why we've been able to competitively fundraise to stay in this long and to earn all the endorsements that we've gotten. So we knew it was coming and, and we're not worried. Um, Manhattan has always been a, a city of kind of wheel, uh, not kind of, but corruption, wheeling and dealing. Who has the money? Uh, you know, the powerful, the elite. Um, somebody with a progressive agenda like yours. How how have you been cutting through um, in trying to deal with everything that Manhattan, specifically and, and New York City, has been all about all these years? Well. There's two sides to this. One, the overwhelming majority of people arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated in our city are people of color, particularly the Black and Latino communities, and even the subset of that are our young men. And so we have to talk about public safety from that perspective. We have to talk about accountability from the system from that perspective and center those voices. Because typically how the DA races go down is we talk about public safety from the perspective of those who are safe and comfortable being more safe and comfortable. And then let's talk about special treatment for the powerful and privilege, which we've just heard over and over again from the current district attorney's uh, office. And so we need somebody that's going to be independent from that power structure that doesn't rub elbow with the people that may come under criminal investigation. And so we won't be putting any badge or bank account above the law and being neutral and being independent and centering everyone else who is also impacted by these policies has allowed us to cut through a lot of the noise. Uh, and we've gotten that broad based support because of it. Um, have have you run into, I mean, obviously you've ran into it in your life being here in New York City, you're a Brooklynite, uh, being a Palestinian American, uh, being a Muslim woman. Um, talk about, you know, the racism in our city of Manhattan and specifically in New York City, I mean, in, in our city of New York and specifically in Manhattan. Um, you know, New York likes to run around and a lot of people act super progressive and front like they're liberals, but uh, they're really, you know, there's a lot of white supremacy and, and racism that uh, black and brown people are dealing with every day in this city. And running for this office, how has the run been? How has the race been for you? You know, I think that's a great question. And one of the ways to cut through the people who are into the hype and the headlines and the talking points uh, and those who are down to do the work and support a candidate that is completely different. You can't hold me to any mold of any traditional office in this city because we are so different and what we represent is so different. Not just the fact that I'm this 
six foot Palestinian hijabi running around the city, um, running for an office like Manhattan District Attorney, but also because come from the impacted community. And so uh, it's really interesting to see people, uh, their opinions, um, what they think would fit, what wouldn't fit, uh, people who wanted me to talk a certain way or do things differently um, because they were afraid that, um, or concerned with, can we really break the mold? And so there was a lot of education that had to go down. There's a lot of pushing and shoving uh, of the limits and saying, no, I'm running because I want to center the communities impacted by these policies, the communities that are over-policed, over-prosecuted. This is who we are. Um, and we should not only have a seat at the table, but we should be in positions like Manhattan District Attorney and lead the conversation about how things need to change. Um, how did you How did you get um, in front of and aligned with people like a Kyrie Irving um, and some of the, you know and and this this community that you know we have on this program a lot? But how did how did those relationships start? They were very organic. You know, um, we started off just putting our positions, our values, our policies out there and being unequivocal. We're not going to buckle under pressure. We're not going to be afraid to talk about police accountability, prosecutor accountability. We're not going to be afraid to talk about that the powerful and privileged get away with a lot of things in our city. We're going to be as raw and direct as possible. And, and it attracted people like Kyrie and Snoop on their own. Um, and who saw our social media and said, I'm down with this. And if we can help, if they can pitch in and change the conversation and elect somebody that is going to consider everyone's public safety, then that's something that they wanted to be a part of. And, and we've been able to grow just a really incredible base from, from our movement. I, I don't want to dwell on this too long because obviously your celebrity endorsements aren't the most important thing you have going. Um, yeah. But... Kyrie is a misunderstood guy uh, quite a bit and talked about a lot in the city. What can you tell us about him and the interest that he's shown uh, in your campaign and, and really these important social justice issues? You know, Kyrie's real. Um, he is committed to the issues that he cares about. He goes all the way, uh, you know, being invited to his game when a, a big game, uh, one of the most talented players in the world invited me to come down and hang out courtside uh, on the game um, and it was an incredible experience, but he was sharing his platform with us, right? He wanted mm -hmm. people to know about what we stand for and what we're trying to do here. And that's incredible because yeah, it's great to have friends who are celebrities, but we're talking about something that needs real investment, whether it's donating, volunteering, sharing a platform, helping us get the word out there. And so he's someone that goes all the way and, and I'm incredibly grateful for his friendship and his support. Um, Tahani, what about, uh, we just talked to Andrew Yang about this, and I'd be remiss, uh, you being a Palestinian, um, me being a Jew, for us not to have a conversation about the divide that we have in this city. And obviously that's not what you your job would have to deal with specifically, but it is an issue that people care about deeply. And we do see such a divide. We see hate crimes. We've seen violent protests both directions. We've just seen a, a real mess. Um, what can you offer um, in terms of your thoughts of how we can bring the the Jewish and Palestinian communities of New York together moving forward? You know, I'll even zoom out even further than just uh, Jews and Palestinians. When you talk about hate crimes, uh, you know, people, especially during the pandemic, are stuck home with their phones or TVs and just being fed a ton of information. And it's extremely emotional, it's very stressful, and there's really not much outlet for dialogue. We have our social media that allows us for this instant response that we throw out there. So whether we're angry, we're sad, we're frustrated, we're just shooting out statements left and right, but we need to create space for dialogue, education, for accountability in a meaningful way, um, and, not, and not be afraid to call out wrongdoing. And I think that um, that's really what's been missing from the dialogue as it pertains to hate crimes um, or even things going on around the world. So it's important to just create that space uh, and invest resources in allowing those dialogues to happen. Mm. Um, on that note, Tahani, have you had uh, meaningful meetings and gotten meaningful support from any groups in the Jewish community? 
Yeah, we are supported by um, Jews for Racial and Economic uh, Justice and their C4, the Jewish Vote. They've thrown down with us for a long time. This is a group that I've worked with personally for many years in New York City, whether it was in response to hate crimes or police violence, um, social inequities that we are fighting against. Um, we've stood shoulder to shoulder many times. And so these are uh, some of our, our friendship and support uh, is new. And a lot of them are our relationships we've had for a very long time dealing with these issues. On your on Tahani for DA, if anybody wants to go look for it. And also remember early voting has already started so you can get out and vote right now. Um, it says, Tahani will decarcerate through decriminalization of poverty, mental illness, and substance uh, use disorder. She will end the history of discriminatory prose uh, prosecutorial policy and transform the prosecution system. Can you tell us how? The how? Because we, we hear these words a lot. Right. But what's the how? Right. So as a civil rights lawyer, my job is to build these complex civil litigation type cases where they're based on data and facts. So tracking what it looks like when we're prosecuting cases, what cases go forward, which cases don't, how are these cases resolved and which communities uh, do the brunt of these prosecutions fall on. And so when you go through my decline to prosecute list, things like disorderly conduct, trespassing, low level offenses that make up a bulk of the prosecution in the Manhattan DA's office are falling on communities of color. And when you look at how these cases are resolved, majority of them end in a plea uh, and they're attached with fines and fees. And so it's relegating this office to essentially being a debt collector. And we're not talking about public safety. We're not talking about rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. What it's becoming is that if we can catch uh, and convict the low hanging fruit, let's do that. Instead of focusing on the more serious violent crimes like our murders, our homicides, our rapes that have a pretty low clearance rate, we can do better. Um, and so when we talk about shrinking the footprint of this office and decarcerating it, it means let's invest resources into the social inequities that are giving rise to these kinds of crimes um, and alleviate them instead of this automation of just prosecute, convict and release um, that doesn't make us safer, but further destabilizes these communities. Uh, and that will help us tackle this problem in a meaningful way. If you are with uh, standing at a debate stage, I don't think they have a DA debate. I don't think that happens, but let's just, you know, hypotheticals for a second. Uh, if you are on stage with the candidates that you're up against right now, um, what makes you better than uh, Tally Weinstein um, or Eliza Orleans? How is your platform uh, much better for Manhattan? Well, several ways, but two of the most important ways is one, we can't discount the lived experience anymore. You know, uh, one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin is, is when he's told to wait for progress. And he says, it's taken my mother's time, my father's time, my brother's and sister's time. How much time do you want for your progress? That is the question we're answering here. How much more time are we going to give people who operate from ivory towers, this authority, this position, um, that's going to keep us on the outside, banging on the doors of justice to be seen as human beings, for our families to be seen, for them to take into consideration the destabilization that happens across the board when someone comes into contact with this system. And so we can't discount that lived experience because I fight against the fact that some people will say, look, I know your family went through it. I know you're dealing with incarceration um, or any of these social inequities, but let me tell you why I know better. Let me tell you why I know what, what you should or shouldn't be doing here. So we have to bring that lived experience into this conversation. The second part of it is this is not an issue that can be tackled by only ever been a prosecutor, or only ever been a criminal defense attorney. You have to come at this from all sides. And that was that's what I do as a civil rights attorney. We see the impact from all perspectives. So whether we're talking about alternatives to incarceration, preventative measures, our youth, rehabilitation, successful reentry into our community. We need somebody that has seen it from all sides and I'm the only candidate that has done it from all sides. Um, so the point where we've changed policy. So um, I think that sets me apart. And, and one thing I'll say about, you know, Tali Farhadi and Weinstein is that um, she's from the Billionaires Club. 
And she's taken a lot of Wall Street money and we should be worried about that because I asked her in a debate if she would recuse herself if her donors came under criminal investigation and she refused. Um, and she was asked again during one of our bar association um, forums and everyone, every other candidate said they would recuse themselves and she wouldn't. And so I don't think we should trust that someone that comes from such a small circle can be independent from those power structures um, and will not be given, you know, special favors to people. So they do, have a, they do have a DA debate. I didn't even know that happened. I missed it. Well, there's one actually coming up uh, on the 17th on Thursday. Um, I think it's, I don't know, I'm going to mess up the station, but uh, I will send it your way. This one will be the only one that has ever been in person. Everything else has been on Zoom. So we can send that information your way. But is it is it unfair though, Tahani, to like to punish Tali for her background? I mean, as she tells it, her life wasn't always that of being rich. And I feel that one thing that we have a tendency to do on as a progressive can be to, you know, we want to be open minded to everyone, but then we hear that someone comes from money and we could be like, hey, shut up. Is <laughs> is that we're open to everyone right? except billionaires and white supremacists and corporations? Well, nobody's saying she should be punished for having money, right? What we're saying is you're running a race, you know who your donors are, you make the decision to take money from donors or not. And when you accept money from Wall Street donors, uh, a, a place and, and an issue that is very concerning for New Yorkers, um, then you're making a decision to dismiss those concerns. And these are concerns that have come up with previous candidates. So it's not just Tali has money, that's why we're, we're frustrated, it's, it's Wall Street trying to buy the race again. And I'll tell you that for our race, it's kind of like the Wild West. The individual max here is $35,000. So this is not a $500 donation we're talking about. This is some people's salary here in New York City for the year. Um, and that's a pretty big investment. And so it's something that we, we have to be concerned about. Fair. So, honey, I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine when talking about the race and um, when looking at your platform and your website, you know, you do say that, uh, like Ibra pointed out, that you will decline to prosecute, you know, charges stemming from poverty, which includes mental illness, sex work, you know, substance abuse. The first thing a friend of mine said, yeah, but I'm not sure if I really want prostitution and, and, and you know, and drug use all over my block. And, and it was really an interesting concern of her because she was like, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. And I don't know if that is going to lean towards me voting for someone like her. So what do you have to say to people who feel like that? Well, I say two things. One, um, majority of our drug related prosecutions are of recreational amounts of sale and possession, which is a bigger indicator that people are suffering from substance use disorder. And so all we do in the system is we'll arrest you, we'll prosecute you, you'll plea out to something, you'll have to pay a fine and fee, and then you'll go on your way. Never having addressed the substance use disorder part of the problem. And so we've actually exacerbated it because now this person walks out with a criminal record, an arrest record, a fine that they probably can't pay. And that's the cycle that has persisted. And so with all the prosecutions that we've done, we haven't touched the issue, the drug problem, uh, we've actually locked people in to those issues. So what I'm saying is, instead of pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars for these easy prosecutions, let's back up and find ways to actually address that root cause because it's happening anyway, right? We're doing all these prosecutions and convictions, the drug problem still persists. So this cannot be the only answer, the only response every time. And then moving on to sex work, there's two things, right? One, we have to respect the consensual engagement between adults of sex. And I understand that money makes it uncomfortable, but we have to separate that from human trafficking, which are laws we have on the books and laws we will absolutely prosecute and protect victims of trafficking. But here, when you talk to sex workers, um, there's two sides to it. One is that consensual engagement. And then second, it's those who are being prosecuted under the uh, intention that I'm gonna get the guy on top, the person on top who's running this ring. If I get the little people, the low hanging fruit, then I can get the one that's running the show. And that's just not how it happens. And again, all of these things end up in these criminal proceedings that end up in fines and fees, never addressing the problem. And the other concern with the sex work is that it has given rise to some serious and disgusting abuses by the NYPD vice unit. 
that have completely taken advantage of people that they are arresting in the name of controlling prostitution. Um, and we have to make sure that we disband that unit. We have to make sure that people who wanna get out of this work have a safe path to report the crime instead of being afraid that if I say something, I'm going to be arrested and prosecuted and that's where the case ends. And so by decriminalizing it, we remove criminal penalties we allow for that consensual engagement to occur, and then we allow for safe reporting of crimes for those that are engaged in sex work. And the Manhattan DA's office has already gone on that path, so the current district attorney has begun to decriminalize um, prostitution. It sounds, um, Tahani, like what you're proposing, which uh, other other um, people have came on this program, politicians uh, and, and, and even activists, proposing a society that actually works to help improve people's lives versus just uh, taking advantage of people. And you're also expecting that, to Laura's question, you know, people who live and hear these things understand the work that needs to be done. I fear sometimes that we become so lazy as a society that when we hear what you're saying, what we hear is, oh, you're trying to help criminals. And that's just lazy. How do you, how do you, you know, this is a, a, a long journey that we're on as a society to, to approach criminal, uh, criminal justice and our, our, in our incarceration system differently. Um, some people want to do the work, some people don't or, and don't want to take the time. What do you say to that? I say we're trying to prevent criminals from existing, right? The system comes in after the fact now and says, let's outdo the harm that we think was done and that's it, we walk away. But in that process, we miss many instabilities before it ever becomes a crime. And when it does become a crime, we say, ha, see, I told you so. This is a problem and all we can do is, is spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to arrest and prosecute this person, not ever caring why it even happened. And so the important part of the conversation around public safety that is always missing is how do we prevent crime? How do we stop it from happening? And for those that do come into contact with our system and are prosecuted, yeah, jail, prison, always an option. Prosecution is always an option, right? But is it getting to the root cause? Have we let the victim know that we're working on making sure this never happens to you again, or doesn't happen to your loved ones, or that anyone else in your neighborhood or in our city experiences something like this, because that too is our responsibility. And when you just see where all the money is going in our system, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are pumped to arrest and prosecute somebody, public safety is not impacted by these low level offenses, and we're not preventing things as nearly as we can, as nearly as we could, and we're not even supporting victims as much as we can. And so that's what I tell people. We, we want to do something about it, but we have to roll up our sleeves and get in the gutter to clean it up and make sure that we stop these things from happening in the first place. And I will say also this, when it comes time to those who have the power and privilege in our city, the conversation around public safety is very different. When you talk about white collar crimes, these are not victimless crimes. Whether it, it's the mortgage fraud that brought our country to its knees, Ponzi schemes, wage theft, exploitation of our workers. Those are serious crimes too, but the conversation is never about, oh, I'm afraid that this is happening. It's, well, we can take our time with it. Let's, let's not go crazy and jump to jail and prison. Let's take a minute and talk about this and think it through. And that's the conversation we need to expand to all of the crimes that are under our jurisdiction. Um, you, you get the job, you're a Manhattan DA. Um, you inherit uh, what uh, Cy Vance is clear, uh, doing right now with the Trump, admit, Trump. I, I guess it's the Trump, uh, I guess we'll call it. Investigation. Corporation. Um, do you see a case here? Have you looked at the facts? Have you read any of the details? Well, I only have what's publicly available to everyone else. So I'm in the same position as the rest of us civilians here. I'm looking forward to getting the, the rest of the facts as district attorney of Manhattan. But I think one thing that's crucial is to not buckle under the pressure to look the other way or shut the investigation down to make sure that we are independent from that power structure and we can continue the investigation um, independent uh, of those who might want us to shut it down because 
this is this is a case that has been hyped up a lot for uh, the public and the community. There's always information coming out about it, um, and people want to see what the next steps are going to be with it. So, I'm looking forward to to getting that inside information as district attorney and continuing the investigation. Do you um do you see any other major crimes happening Wall Street, Manhattan that are a priority for you right now that maybe us laymen and us regular folks don't even know is happening to us in the city of New York? Wage theft is a big problem, um, especially to our immigrant communities, documented or not. Um, it's and that's something people just not, wage theft is people just not getting paid or not getting paid what they should be getting paid both and and employers and big corporations circumventing the law so that they cut out their pay benefits they designate them a certain way so that they can avoid paying taxes or pass the, or pass the tax um uh onto their employers unsafe working conditions um these are things that you know thousands of our families go to work every day and they're not getting paid what they're owed and their lives are being put at risk um, and it's serving the interests of these big corporations. And so that's something we absolutely have to take serious um, as the Manhattan District Attorney. And just to reiterate for the audience, a candidate that takes money from Wall Street that's running for Manhattan DA likely won't be holding Wall Street accountable for crimes, correct? I think the concern there is that it's too close for comfort. These are $35,000 donations from people you know. Got We're it. talking about hedge fund managers, executives. Um, it's it's too close for comfort. I mean, the current DA had taken donations from defense counsel who appeared um, before him, and there was a lot of concern that was raised. He resisted, and then in the end said, "I get it. This is not a fight uh, that I want to keep fighting, uh, and I and I understand the conflict of interest here." And that's the same applies to all of the candidates in this race um, and the donations we take that we should be conscious of the conflicts of interest that would arise and how uncomfortable it would make the public. Tahani for DA. Look her up. Uh, my favorite candidate for sure. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you so for coming much. on the program and everybody uh, get out there and get your early vote on. Uh, when do when does this uh, voting cycle close down, Laura? Is it June 22nd? Tuesday. Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Okay. Good luck to Honey. Thank you so much. Thank you, honey. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Later.